Hello and welcome to this Property Hub University course on how to pick the right property strategy for you. Such an important topic. I'm Rob D. I'm joined by Rob B. And what we're going to do in this course is explain the major strategies and help you pick the one that's most appropriate for you, given your goals, your constraints and what you enjoy. Which strategy should I follow is one of the most common questions that people ask when they start out. And rightly so. Because there are a lot of mistakes that can be made if you choose an inappropriate strategy, and that can cost you time or it can cost you money. You might even give up on property because you pick the wrong path and just think, ah, oh, you know, property is not for me or it's all a scam or whatever. But in fact, if you just picked the right strategy, you could have been absolutely fine and done really great things. So it's absolutely something that people are right to be thinking about, but it's something that people also get very held up with. So you can get stuck on this step for a very long time. And that is what we're going to try to address in this course. So people are paying attention to it as they should be, but not getting held up on this for years and years. So stop. Before we get excited, and that's that's us, not you, but you might be getting excited by the content coming up too. You must do something before you even get going. And this really is the number one mistake, particularly with new investors that we see, is they try and pick a strategy and then go. But what they haven't done is focused on their destination. What are they trying to achieve? So many people go, oh, I want to do this strategy. I want to do that strategy. And you ask them why, and then they start to have a bit of an answer. And then you say, well, how's that going to help you get to your goal? And the answer becomes even weaker. So get very focused on what you want to achieve, what your outcomes are. As I mentioned, it's the biggest mistake people make. The consequences, though, of not doing it are pretty terrifying. You could end up investing for a year or two and then wonder what you've done and why you're doing it. Without that focus and that end goal, you could lose motivation. You could as Rob mentioned, make mistakes and do a strategy that just doesn't suit you. Or worse still, you could lose money. So make sure before you go any further and get excited about all the strategies we're going to talk about is get very clear on what you want to achieve in what time frames, setting smart goals. And once you've done that, you're almost ready to go. But there's one more step before you, we do. Yep. Having thought about where you want to get to in a lot of detail and be really clear and honest with yourself about that. Stop again and take some time to think about where you are right now. So what is your starting position? And you need to think about this in terms of several different things. So there's the amount of money that you've got, the capital that you have to invest. That's really important. If you've got £10,000 or a million pounds, that's going to open up very different strategies to you. So you need to actually start by doing an audit and working out how much money you can invest. But that's not the only thing you should be thinking about. You've also got to be thinking about the time that you have available. So is this going to be a full-time thing for you? Is this going to be like, you know, you've got an hour a week at best, or is it somewhere in between? This again is going to affect the strategy that you can adopt. Also, think about the skills that you have. So are you brilliant at negotiating? Are you brilliant at analysis and numbers? Are you brilliant at hands-on practical work? That's a factor as well. And don't neglect your tolerance to risk because some strategies are more risky than others. And also there are different types of risk and it's all relative. There might be one type of risk that you're absolutely fine with and one that terrifies you. And for your best friend, it might be the complete opposite. You just need to be aware of all these things. Being self-aware will help you to make better choices. So be honest with yourself and think about this properly. It sounds really basic, but working out your starting position is really important. Working out your end position, as Rob talked about a minute ago, is also really important. Once you've got those two points locked down, then all your strategy is going to do is find what is going to be for you the quickest and safest and easiest way between those two points. If you don't know what those two points are, it's impossible for you to find the best route between them. It sounds really obvious, but it's amazing how many people just rush into things without knowing both of those two points. That's essential. But put the time in, understand those, and once you know, then comes the strategy. 
that's where you link those two points up and you find the way that you're going to get from where you are now to where you want to go. So let's look at the strategies. We're going to look at all the mainstream strategies, the one that most people do. And we're also going to look at some of the more quirky strategies you may have come across on your internet travels. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the strategy itself, what it is, why you might want to consider it, why you might rule it out, and also try and pinpoint really who is it best for, who does this strategy suit. So we're going to go through several strategies now. Feel free to take notes, stop the video if you need to, to write stuff down. This is for you. Go through it in your own time and take advantage of it. And let's start off with a strategy that's normally quite popular with newbies when they start. They are often attracted to this one. It's HMOs. Yeah, HMOs, always very attractive to people when they're starting out. And we'll look at why that is in a second. But first of all, what is it? HMO, if you've never heard of it before, all that basically means is renting out a property by the room. So it stands for a house in multiple occupation. So you take one house and instead of renting it out to a single family, say, you rent it out room by room to people who possibly don't know each other. So it's also known as a multi-let. That's all it is. Why would you want to do it? Why is it so attractive to a lot of people when they're starting out? Well, quite simply, you can make more money. And that's a pretty compelling argument. You can make more money from the same property. Because when you are renting them out by the room, you add up the sum of all the individual room rates, and it adds up to more than if you just rented out the property as a single unit. So you take the same house, which costs you roughly the same amount of money, and you make more money from it. Of course, that's why it's popular. So why would you not do that? Why doesn't everyone do this? Well, there's a few reasons. The big one, the obvious one, is that it's a lot more work. Of course it is. If you've got five people living in a house, all on separate tenancies who don't know each other, it's going to be a lot more management. Because for a start, you're going to have people moving in and out all the time. People who live in HMOs tend to be quite mobile. They'll just stay somewhere for six months maybe and then move on. And if you've got five different people all moving every six months, that means there's almost always going to be something for you to be doing in terms of marketing the rooms, uh, dealing with check-ins, check-outs, all that sort of thing. There's also more management overhead because... If you've got all these people in a house together, there's potential conflicts between them. There's things that you'll need to sort out that you otherwise wouldn't need to, such as bills. You'll normally pay all the bills in the property. You'll often provide a cleaner to make sure that it stays in good condition. And the property is going to be used more intensively because there are more people there. They'll be there for more of the time often. So there's going to be more to do in terms of management. And also, it's more of a regulated area. So in many areas, it varies between different locations, but there's often more regulations and legislation around this, which can mean upfront cost and upfront hassle and more for you to do as you go along as well. So yes, you make more money, but that of course, there's no such thing as just a way of making more money more easily. There's downsides as well. So that's not to say that those downsides mean nobody should do it some people, this is the right thing to do. So who's it best for? Well, HMOs are probably best for somebody who has cash flow as a priority. So making an income now rather than having capital gain later. Everyone in an ideal world, of course, will want both of those. But you're always going to be skewed towards one or the other depending on your goals, as we've talked about. So this is more of a cash flow strategy. So if that's something you want, HMOs seem like a good option. But it also is something that's going to take some time and maybe even some experience. So you can get started with an HMO, but it's more common to move into it once you've already got some property experience. So who's it best for? Somebody who's got income as a requirement, that's their main goal, and somebody who's got the time and possibly the experience to put into making it a success. Because this can go very wrong if you look at the the money, you look at the upside, but you don't think about what needs to be done to make that happen. Now cement your learning by taking a quiz. Then we'll move on to the next module. Next on our list, refurbs and holding them. Okay, so what is that? Well, refurbishing properties, you will buy a property that you can either add value 
or is distressed and needs bringing up to date and adding value that way. You can tackle this two ways. The easier one to get your head around is that you see a property like you do on homes under the hammer. That's a bit of a wreck. You go in, you tidy it up, put it in your kitchen, bathroom, in nice flooring, get tenants in and let it out. Or another way of approaching it is looking at the property, seeing that you can extend it, convert it possibly, change it into a HMO that Rob's talked about by refurbing it as well, and then letting it out. So there's there's more than one way of approaching this. Why would you do it? Well, it's the adding value part. You potentially could buy a property for below what it's worth because it's putting other people off because it's not in good condition. It might not even be in condition that's mortgageable right now, which again will remove people from the equation. And you can go in bring it up to a good standard, let it out, but here's where it gets quite interesting, is then possibly look to refinance it because you've added value and extract a large amount of the money you've put in, if not all of it. So that's what makes it very attractive. That's why people like this strategy because it allows them to get a property, go in, do the work and get enough money out to go again. So appealing to people who want to continue to build a portfolio. Why would you not go for this strategy? Well, there's the work involved for that reward. The rewards are attractive. The fact you can keep building a portfolio and snowball it into something bigger and hold on to those assets. But the downside is you need the skills either to bring the refurb up to standard or the skills to manage people to bring that refurb up to standard. And you need the time to do it. Whether you're doing it yourself or you're managing people to do it, both will take time. And a certain amount of expertise is needed as well so that you don't make poor decisions or worse still, someone take advantage of you by charging you too much for a piece of work, which will then hit your profits. So that's possibly why you wouldn't do it. The other thing is, it's a risk there as well. When you've refurbed it, you believe it's going to be worth a certain value. But what if your valuer disagrees? All that work and effort could be for nothing if the valuer doesn't feel that you've achieved the uplift that you've gone after. And also, if you've been doing the work, if the market's gone in your favour, then that's great. It may have increased slightly while you've been doing the work, which helps with the refinance. But what happens if it goes against you and the market dips while you're doing the refurb and you simply can't do the refinance because even though you've added value, the market's dipped 10%. So, While that scenario is an unlikely strategy, it could bring this strategy to a complete halt. So worth bearing in mind. So the advantages, the chance to build a portfolio, add value, extract it and keep on going. The disadvantages, the skill is needed, time is needed and there's a bit of risk there as well. So who's it best for? Well, for those who want to build a portfolio, who have limited funds, maybe enough only to do one property, then this will appeal to them. It should appeal more if you have the skills to refurbish property and the time to do it. And if you haven't got that, but you have got project management skills and the time to do it, then it may appeal as well. But if you don't have refurbishment skills, you don't have project management skills, and you don't have time, you probably shouldn't be considering this. So while the results are attractive... The process of getting the results are only going to suit some individuals. If you're an amateur, you're not a DIY person, you haven't managed people on site before, and you're time poor, you might want to stay away from this one. But if you have those things in your favour, you might want to take advantage of this strategy. Okay, the next strategy we're going to look at is very similar. So you're still doing the same thing, you're doing a refurb, but then you're selling the property at the end. So that's all it is. You'll hear about buy to sell you'll hear about flipping. It's all the same thing. It's just buying a property normally that needs some work doing to it, or maybe you're adding value in another way by extending the property. But in some way, you're adding value to that property and then you're selling it on for more than what you paid it for plus what you spent on it. So anything over and above those amounts of money is your profit. So that's all it is. If you've ever seen Homes Under the Hammer, you'll be very familiar with this. It's something that's got a lot more prominence in recent years. And because of programs like that, it's something that a lot of people have decided to go out and do. Why would you do it? Well, the main reason is that you can make big lumps of money in one go. So if you're renting property out, whether it's as an HMO or a buy-to-let, 
you get some money every month, which is great. And over time, the value of the property goes up, which is great too. But it doesn't give you a big lump of money straight away. If you're flipping a property, you get all your profit straight away. So you do the work, you sell the property. If you've made a £20,000 profit, that £20,000 all goes into your bank account. And yes, you have to pay tax on it, but it's yours. You've got that straight away. That's why you might want to do it. Why wouldn't you do that? Well, it all comes back again to your goals. So if for you, you want to build up a portfolio, so you've got in, say, 20 years time when you come to retire, you've got a steady stream of rental income, or if you've built an asset base that you can pass on or something like that, then clearly this isn't going to be for you. And that sounds really obvious, but you'd be surprised how often you'll be talking to an investor who will say, oh yeah, I really want to do some flips. That sounds great. That's something I'd really like to do. But then you talk to them about their goals and go, oh yeah, well, I want to build a portfolio. But they're completely different things. So if you're looking at kind of long-term returns, then flipping in itself isn't going to make any sense for you. It could form part of your strategy. So you could use flips to make some money and then invest that money in buy-to-lets or some other kind of investment. But on its own, that isn't going to make any sense. There are some other reasons why you might not want to do it as well. Most of those are the same as what Rob's talked about in the context of doing the, the refurb and then keeping the property. You might not want to do it if you don't have a lot of time because whether you're managing people or doing it yourself there's still going to be a lot of time involved. And if you expect to just kind of hand the keys over to your building team and come back a month over and see that the job's finished, you're going to be very disappointed. So it's something that you need to have the time and the headspace to be thinking about all the time. And it might also not be for you if you don't like the stress. It is a stressful process, both in getting the job done and then getting the sale afterwards especially if you're up against it because you've borrowed money that you need to pay back in a certain period of time. And you're worried about whether you'll get the offers in for the property or you're worried about whether it will go through in time. It's stressful. If you don't deal well with that, then it's not for you, even if all the other indicators are that it's the perfect strategy. It comes back to that self-knowledge again. So who's it best for? It's best for somebody who wants to have cash now They want to make big amounts of money quickly rather than thinking about the long term and who has the time and possibly the skills and the temperament to deal with it. If you are that person, it can be fantastic, but this could also go very wrong if you're the wrong type of person. And that's where being honest with yourself is so important. Now, cement your learning by taking the quiz. Then we'll move on to the next module. So after all that, you probably feel like you need a holiday. Well, we've got the perfect investment for you, or have we? Holiday lets. So what are holiday lets? Well, I don't think you're going to need too much help with this one. It's buying a property that is in a holiday location and you let it out. So that may be in the UK, in places like Cornwall or Lake District or any other tourist hotspot, or maybe places like Spain, Florida, or something in the Alps. Wherever people like to spend their holidays, that's a place that you could possibly find a property that you could let out. So why would you take this strategy on? Well, first of all, you can make some good money. People are willing to pay good sums of money to have a nice holiday. And if you've got a nice property in a popular area, you can make a good cash flow. So people are going to be attracted to this type of strategy for that reason. But if we're being really honest, it seems that most people are attracted to this strategy because they own a property somewhere nice that they may want to use themselves. The thought of owning a holiday home appeals to a lot of people. Lots of property investors talk about it. And it's understandable. You know, if you have a soft spot for the French Alps and you have a property there, then you could probably see yourself using it a few times a year. And letting it out as well, great, you're making some money on top. So that's why it's going to appeal to people. And if people are really honest with themselves, It's that glamour factor that attracts the majority of people to this strategy. But you can make money off it and have no emotional attachment to the property. So why would you not do it? Well, it's that emotional factor again. 
A lot of people are attracted to it because of the glamour of owning a property and somewhere they'd like to stay. Is that the best place for an investment? Possibly not. The other thing to bear in mind as well is that while these places may be popular part of the year round, they might not be popular the whole year round. So while, for example, in Cornwall, you can get great rents during the summer holidays, in the winter months, it can be more of a challenge to let them out. Not impossible, but you certainly have to reduce your rates and expect a lower occupancy rate. So that cash flow in many areas isn't as strong all year round. The other thing that puts people off is while having a holiday home is attractive, managing a holiday home is less attractive and it can take a lot of work. The people who go on holiday who are willing to pay good money to stay in these places also have high expectations of the accommodation they are going to stay at. So they are going to complain more often than not a lot more quickly than a standard tenant in a standard property because they understandably have high expectations of what their holiday should deliver. So you are going to be, if you manage it yourself, on call and available throughout the year to the people who aren't just staying there, but also have inquiries about staying in your property and probably have a lot of questions as well about the property, the local area and what they can do there. So there's a big in time investment into holiday lets. You can outsource that management process, but it will cost you, and understandably so, because there is a lot of work involved, as we discussed. And then finally, there's the mortgage issue. Make sure that when you go for one of these properties, particularly in the UK, that the lender, if you choose to mortgage the property, is happy for you to let them out as holiday lets. Many buy-to-let mortgages won't allow you to do this. So check that. Are you covered from a legal point of view as well? So who's it best for? I think it's best for people who are honest with themselves. If you see it as a holiday home first and the investment side of it is a bonus, then crack on. That's fine. Go for it. But if you're trying to kid yourself that this is a holiday home, but also a great investment, then maybe not. You can probably do better with some of the other strategies if you're looking for capital growth and returns with less effort. There are certainly many options that we're discussing today that would better suit for those purposes. But if you want the romance of holiday home, you're honest with yourself, you accept what we've just said to be true, then go for it. There's no harm in it. Maybe you're further down with your portfolio and this is a nice addition that is a bit of a hybrid between the two. Okay, so that was a strategy that sounds very romantic, very attractive, and maybe it is, but Rob's given you a lot to think about as well. Next up is a strategy that doesn't sound like that at all. In fact, it sounds terrifying to a lot of people. So the question is, is it actually as terrifying as it sounds? And that is LHA lets, or in other words, letting to people on housing benefit. Now, the terminology is quite confusing here. You'll hear lots of things. So LHA is local housing allowance. That's a form of benefit that people get to cover their housing. You'll also hear this referred to as DSS lets. That's what it used to be called. Hasn't been for a long time, but people still use that terminology, including the people who receive the benefits themselves. You'll often see like, do you accept DSS? Or listings will say no DSS accepted. That is all talking about the same thing. And then you'll also hear about universal credit, which is the new scheme that a lot of this is moving onto. But it all means the same thing. And it all boils down to the same thing. Letting property, so normal buy to let, but specifically to people who are claiming housing benefit. That's what it is. Why would you do it? And why are we talking about it as being separate from other types of buy to let? Well, the reason is that the pricing, uh, the dynamics that move the market are different. Because while you've got supply and demand setting the price in normal buy to let markets, you've got that here, but then you've also got something extra, which is the amount of money that the government will give someone towards their housing. So there's a way that this is calculated, which we won't go into right now. But what it can do is create kind of strange distortions in the market. So you can get positions where, say, in a particular area, if you were renting out a property to somebody who didn't claim LHA, you'd be able to get £400 a month for it. That's what you'd get on the open market if you said no LHA, no no DSS. But because of the way it's calculated and the way the areas work, you could find that somebody in that area 
who was claiming LHA would get £500 towards that property. And to them, it doesn't make a difference whether it's 400 or 500 because that money is purely for their housing. So it's not like if the rent was 400 then they'd get 500 and keep the difference themselves. It doesn't work that way. They'd only get their actual housing cost. So what that means is you can price the property higher than you otherwise would be able to and make more money off the same property. So that's one of the factors that's behind why this can be attractive. The reason is that you can get high yields with this strategy. One of those reasons we've just seen, it's because of the way that the prices are calculated. The other reason is that often houses that are suitable or targeted towards or marketed towards LHA recipients tend to be in lower value areas and tend to be cheaper houses anyway. You combine those two factors and you end up with an asset that doesn't cost you that much money to buy that you can rent out for comparatively quite a lot. That means that your yield is higher than it would be if you were renting out a property in a slightly nicer area with a slightly higher spec to professional tenants. So that's why you would do it. You can make higher yields and it looks very attractive. In the same way as HMOs, you look at the headline figures and you think, yeah, this sounds brilliant. I'm making a 10, 11, 12% yield on this. That sounds great. And that is great. Of course it is. That's a brilliant thing. So why wouldn't you do that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One that's kind of obvious and one that's less obvious, but I think also really, really important. The obvious reason is that management can be more of a challenge. So it's difficult to find a good letting agent. It's extremely difficult to find a good letting agent who can handle LHA. And that's because it involves a different type of management. Often, it involves being more hands-on. The tenants just need more help through the process, and it can be more challenging to get them to pay, and it can be more challenging to make sure that they're looking after the property properly. That's not necessarily the case. I'm not generalizing about any group of people. You could have a terrible experience with absolutely any type of tenant, but as a general rule, it's something that needs to be thought about. Also, in terms of the management being more time consuming, there's bureaucracy involved. So if the money is coming from the government, then that means that they can be issued with payments getting stopped, getting changed, getting cancelled, all sorts of things can go on. And if you want to make sure you get that money, even if it's not directly your responsibility, it's still something that you've got a vested interest in sorting out. So that's the obvious reason why you might not do it. It's more work. But there's another reason as well. And that is that if you're going for these types of property that are cheaper in areas that are less desirable, then you're likely to get less capital growth than you will in other properties. So you'll generally find that although you'll see things like, oh, yeah, property prices double every 10 years or property prices in the UK last year went up by 5%. That doesn't mean that every single property will double in 10 years or every single property went up by 5% last year there will be big variations. And in these types of areas that are a little bit cheaper, you'll generally find that the growth that they get will come later and it won't be as strong. So if you're more interested in the accumulation of wealth in the long term rather than income in the short term, this is not going to be something that you want to do. So who's it best for? Well, it's for somebody who's interested in, in making uh, maximizing their short-term return rather than necessarily maximizing their long-term return. That's something that's important to them, making more money now, that's important. And somebody who's willing to do everything that goes along with it. So whether that's taking the time to find a really great letting agent or whether it's being more hands-on with the management. You need to be willing to do those things if you're going to have that return. And also to have the right temperament for it. So we talked about risk tolerance and we talked about attitude earlier. You'll find that with this type of market, you'll come up against things that will go wrong or that will be challenging. They won't be disastrous necessarily, but you'll need to be able to deal with them. And if you're the kind of person who's going to be stressing out about all these things, about things that, you know, aren't a game changer in the long run, but are a bit of a pain, then this is not likely to give you a comfortable ride. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're right or you're wrong to be concerned about these things. But if you're honest with yourself, you might just go, you know what, that's just not a challenge that I'm up for. That's not for me. And that's fine. 
but it's important to know. So this can be very profitable, but it's not going to be for everyone. Now cement your learning by taking a quiz. Then we'll move on to the next module. So last of our mainstream strategies is professional lets. So what are professional lets? Well, like the title suggests, you get your property, you buy it, and you let it out to professionals. Professionals can mean different things to different people, but often it means people who are working full-time who have the income to comfortably pay for your property and don't need any income support to do that. It's actually the, probably the dullest, if being completely honest, of all the strategies we just talked about because all you do is let it out. That's it. You don't change anything. You don't try any interesting strategy. You just buy your property and let it out to professional people. And that's it. Pretty simple. So why would you do it? Well, for that reason, if you want a simple strategy where you can collect a rent, make a good profit every month without the hassle, without the inconvenience of some of the other strategies we talked about, then this will appeal. It's something that, if you set it up correctly, can take very little of your time. So if you see property as more of an investment and you don't see yourself as a landlord, then this could be the approach. Viewing property as an investment vehicle, professional lets are probably going to be more likely to appeal to you. So this sounds great. I mean, why isn't everybody piling in for this reason? Well, the reason why you might not do it is because it is very much for the long term. Some of the other strategies we talked about have the potential to give you a higher return month on month or the ability to build your portfolio at a slightly faster pace. So it's not going to be for people who aren't prepared to be patient. So that really comes to the question of who this is for. Well, this strategy suits people who see property as a long-term wealth vehicle. They're not that bothered about getting a little bit extra rent now. They're not that bothered about trying to become rich quickly through property. They don't see it as that type of vehicle, which really I'm worried for you if you do, but that's a different course and almost lecture to altogether. But this strategy will appeal to people who want that long-term approach, want the benefits that property can bring, but don't want the hassle in the short term. They just see it as an investment. That's something, if they set up correctly, can run in the background. And that's why so many people end up here, because once they've realized that these other strategies that do seem glamorous on the outset, actually, you pay for them in different ways, be it time, risk, or a combination of both. So professional lets often end up being the default choice for newbies, whereas they're attracted to something like HMOs in the beginning, but often they will go to pro lets in the end if they haven't got the skills and the tolerance to risk that we've talked about previously. So not for everyone, but appealing to many people for those reasons. But patience is key. You're not going to get rich overnight with professional lets, but you can become wealthy in the long term. So we've run through six different strategies there. They're probably the most popular, the most mainstream strategies that you'll come across. And We've given you some pointers about who it's right for, who it's not right for. We'll sort of give you some more ideas about how to decide which one is for you in a minute. But before we do so, we need to quickly name check some other more weird and wonderful strategies that you will come across at some point if you're reading blogs or listening to podcasts or spending some time in the property world. These are strategies that you'll hear a lot about, but don't be fooled. They are a lot more niche than any of the ones that we've just talked about. So what are they? Well, the first is rent to rent. What's that? Well, as it sounds like, it's renting out a property and then sub-renting that to somebody else or to a group of people. So you rent the property for one price and then you rent it out to other people at a higher price and you keep the spread between those two numbers. And of course, you do that with the knowledge of the person who you're renting the property off in the first place, rather than doing it on the quiet. If you do it legitimately by having permission from the owner, from the lender, from everyone else who's involved, then it's a perfectly valid thing to do. But it's not really property investment in my book, because you're not putting down money and getting a return on that money. It's a business rather than an investment. 
And like any business, it can be hard work. You've got to go out and you've got to find these properties in the first place. Then you've got to fill them up and you've got to manage them. You've got to be quite hands-on. All of this needs to be done. But it can, if you're willing to do all this, give you a cash flow. It is something you can use to make money. And it's why it gets talked about a lot, because you can get started with relatively little money, but lots of time and lots of effort, and you can make it work. It can generate cash for you that you can then use for other strategies. But be warned, it's not as easy as people will often make it sound. And like I say, it's not truly investment. It's just a means to generating revenue. Something else that you'll hear about less now than you used to, but you'll still hear about it, are lease options. So this is kind of like rent to rent plus, really. So with a lease option, you'll take over a property, you'll rent it out and you'll make money on that. You'll be paying something to the owner. You'll be collecting money from the tenants and making money there. But also at the beginning, you will agree that at some point you will be able to buy that property for a pre-agreed price. So say that the property is worth £100,000 now. At the point of agreeing the option, you might say, I've got the option to buy this property for £110,000 at any point in the next five years. So you're then hoping that the property will increase in value. So at some point in those five years, it will be worth £130,000. At that point, you can sell the property and make a £20,000 profit, as well as the profit you've been making all along. Well, that sounds brilliant you're not putting down any of the money that you would need if you were going to be buying that property yourself and you're still getting the income and you're still getting the capital gain. And that's why it's a difficult thing to do because most people are not going to give you that option because why would they? If they want to sell their property, they want to get the price that it's worth right now. They don't want to have the possibility of selling you the property in the future and being tied into that obligation with no guarantee of what they're going to get and missing out on the upside. So lease options can be brilliant. They absolutely can. But again, they are very difficult to do because most people are not going to give you that option. So if you're willing to put in the work to find them, great. And if you've got the knowledge and you've done the research to set these all up legally so they don't fall down later, great as well. But don't be fooled into thinking that this is a mainstream thing to do or it's an easy alternative because it's not. The same goes for serviced accommodation, which at the moment is something that is being talked about a heck of a lot. It's kind of like the new lease options. It's the thing that is the trend. It's what everyone is talking about. What is this? Well, it's like a holiday let, but it's targeted more at business travel. So rather than being a nice cottage by the coast, it could be a flat in the city centre. Why would you rent out a property on that basis? Well, because the cash flow is great. You'll make far more money renting the property out by the night than you would if you were renting it out on a long term basis. So the cash flow is fantastic. That's what attracts people. But it is hard work as well. Of course it is. You're managing a property, you've got tenants turning over every few days rather than every year or so. But apart from that, there are challenges as well. So getting a mortgage for serviced accommodation is very difficult. There are very few lenders who will agree to it. You'll get people who are using a property as serviced accommodation on a buy-to-let mortgage. They really shouldn't be doing that and the lender will not be happy when they find out. And also, if we're talking about flats, there are challenges with the lease. A lot of leases will say that a property cannot be used for that purpose. Therefore, if you do use it for that purpose, you're in breach of lease. They can flat out tell you to stop doing that. Otherwise, they'll take action against you. So these are all strategies that, like all the others we've talked about, they all have their plus points. They are all completely viable in the right circumstances. But there are drawbacks, like there are with everything. They're not for everyone, but they're more niche for a reason. They are more specialist and they involve more knowledge and there are more pitfalls. And this is where it's worrying that these things are often promoted to newcomers to property. Really, they're more suitable to people who've been in property for a while and who understand the basics and can then layer some of these on top. But because they tend to involve less money down, they often get marketed to people who are new and really shouldn't be. So these are things to be aware of. They could be right for you. I've told you a bit about who they could be right for, what the attractions are, what the drawbacks are. If it sounds like something that you're interested in, great, go for it. 
But don't be misled into thinking that this is something that everyone's doing, that this is the thing that you should absolutely be doing. It's a no brainer. This is the thing right now, because that's not the case. You'll hear a lot, but the other strategies are far, far more common. So which one's for you? Well, it's obviously option uh, C. Now that's where you have to be careful because we can't tell you which is the right option for you. But most importantly, nobody else can either, unless they understand you as a person and what you're trying to achieve. If someone starts telling you this is the strategy you should be using, but they haven't asked you about your goals, your tolerance to risk, your life circumstances now, then be polite, but switch off mentally. Because what they're doing, even if it's innocent enough, is projecting their preferred strategy on you. You need to know yourself. And by knowing yourself, you can then choose the correct strategy. By setting goals, understanding where you're starting from, it will help you rule in and out strategies. And that's the purpose of this course, is to give you the full spectrum of what's available out there, to give you a good understanding of the main strategies that are out there and what they entail, the plus points, but also the cons. Everyone always talks about the plus points. You know, this is great because, but there are downsides to every single strategy, bar none. So make sure you understand that. But once you understand where you're trying to get to, you understand where you're starting from, you understand the pros and cons of each strategy. The most important thing after that is getting started. Don't have analysis paralysis. You've listened to this course. Think about your goals. We have a course on the Property Hub that's free that talks about goal setting, so you can take advantage of that as well. But after you've done that, put your plan together and get going. Don't procrastinate. Push on. Because actually, the worst thing you can probably do is do nothing at all. So once you've done these steps we've talked about, don't delay any longer. Push on and enjoy the results that can come with the right strategy for you. So which is the best strategy? Well, we haven't given you an answer, but you should now understand why we haven't given you an answer. Because there is no best. There's a best for you, but only you and a few people close to you can really know what that is. But if we've done our job properly, then we should have given you a clear understanding of what these all are and given you some pointers about the ones that you should stay well away from and the ones that are going to be worth looking at further. So congratulations, you finished the course. If you found the subject of strategy interesting, you can deep dive even further on the Property Hub website. Go to the search box on the Property Hub website and type in the subjects that most interest to you. You can start with strategy and go from there. We've got hours upon hours of content that you can take advantage of. So go and do it. Now, just take the final quiz and collect your badge for completing this course. Then get started on another one.